Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Bench Time Live. And of course, we should start with the pause that refreshes. Because, you know, it's just the right thing to do. There we go. Anyway, it's Thursday night. Hope you're uh, doing well. If you're just joining this, uh, I don't see anybody connected right now, but that's okay. I'm sure somebody will stumble in at some point. So this is... I'm your DJ Red Hat. In this case, I'm your engineer Red Hat, talking about uh, all things engineering from the pirate perspective. So we're going to cover some interesting things on this channel, um, some do-it-yourself stuff, uh, projects, things to make your station better, um, or just talking about pirate philosophy. Why do people risk, in theory, tens of thousands of dollars in fines when uh, <clears throat> there's legal ways to do those sorts of things, albeit with a lot less fun? Anyway, so the primary project on tonight's agenda is to try and build a little 10 or 15 or 20 watt transmitter. And so because there's a lot of kind of like Lulu clones and things like that out there. And the Lulu is, is a very simple Class E type transmitter that was put together by a guy, I believe, in Argentina or Brazil, somewhere in South America. And it used basically garden variety parts that he had laying around. And uh, you know, stuff that was relatively easy to source wherever he was and and... To his credit, it's been a very successful transmitter platform. I mean, there's been probably thousands of the things built by people all over the world for either CW transmitters, low-power AMs, whatever. So there's, there's a lot of these transmitters out there. And it is kind of a testament to how successful and simple they are. So having said that... Um, we're going to have our crack at designing one and building one our, of our own for 6.9 megahertz. That's kind of the goal. And so this is the schematic that I came up with. This is basically, and I'll, I'll make sure that this is available in uh, either the show notes or something at a later, later date. Um, but basically, it's about as simple as you can make it. So if we f start at the left, you'll notice we have a... Let me get something to point with here. Because this looks nice and menacing. So we have a little <coughs> programmable oscillator. And these you can order through DigiKey. You can have them programmed to basically any frequency, I think, between 1 and 35 megahertz or something. So we use one of these to our advantage of course if you wanted to feed it with a v vfo or something like that you could although just keep in mind that this signal that feeds the downstream fet driver ic is designed to be ttl or cmos level really so because we have a the voltage in which feeds the the fet driver goes through this 78l05 which is a 5 volt regulator to keep uh the the uh oscillator in its happy spot because it doesn't want to see much more than 5 volts. So the output of that oscillator goes to the input of our FET driver and the FET driver is just think of it as the IC in the Lulu circuit except in this case it's a power device that's designed specifically for driving MOSFETs, fairly large ones. And that's kind of the case here. We've got some other protection circuits up here. Uh, we have a a transorb which is unidirectional so that kind of uh, we can kind of use that as a way to um, as a way to protect against over voltage and also reverse voltage so if this voltage goes backwards this will conduct in the reverse direction and try and keep the damage to a minimum uh, we also have a bypass capacitor and that's really about it for the driver side now on the PA side, obviously the heart of the circuit is this MOSFET down here, and we're going to use a C3M0280 
M090D, which is a third generation silicon carbide MOSFET from Cree. There are many other FETs that can be used. I like these because they they have a 900 volt breakdown voltage rating and it's in a large, easy to use package. It's a TO247 package. Um, the rest of this is all kind of simulated parts that I just kind of chose based on the calculators that are out there. And I can walk you through some of the design process for that and uh, we'll of course put this together and see if it works. So you just have two inductors. This one forms the drain choke. And I just arbitrarily chose a value of 1.5 microhenries. And then the rest of these values were all kind of chosen by the calculator. So <clears throat> let's uh, take a look over at the computer. So this is the calculator that I used to generate uh, the values for this particular circuit. So let's say we want let's say 20 watts and we're going to run nominally from say 12.5 volts the saturation voltage I just kind of took a stab in the dark and figured that you know basically from the data sheet for the MOSFET it's 280 milliohms and they quantify that in the data sheet at six and a half or seven and a half amperes of uh, current and so if through a little bit of you know typical I squared R if we have say, what is it, uh, brain's not working, 7.5 times 0.28, you have roughly 2 volts, so that's fine. So let's just say for S's and G's that it winds up being somewhere around there. We'll set uh, our loaded Q to 5, because that seems to be a, a useful value, they say and uh, let's start our frequency at 6900 kilohertz and of course notice it's in Hertz also notice that we have a feed choke value of point zero oops zero zero one five so milli micro so actually we need to go more than that oops Zero zero one five. I think that because it's milli micro, yeah, right. Cam kangaroo hop down up, drinking chocolate milk. Isn't that what that is? And so it's telling us that the va the shunt capacitor should be around nineteen hundred picofarads, and the series capacitor in series with the load should be twenty one hundred nanofarads and. Uh, again, this is slightly different than the values that we had prior because if you look, I had calculated, I think, around 2017 picofarads total for the shunt capacity across the drain and source of the uh, MOSFET. And the series capacity was like 2986. And according to this, we're supposed to have 2100. So that might be significant enough to cause a problem. I guess we'll find out. Now there's there's no guarantee that any of this is going to behave itself so it's just gonna... oh, we lost data there. So there's no guarantee that this is going to work as we anticipate but I don't know, we'll see what happens I guess. And We also need to create a matching network because if you look at the data here it's saying that our load resistance is 2.8 ohms and uh, that's a long long way from 50. Uh, you can play with the values too a little bit and just kind of see if it changes the the characteristics of the PA any and you'll notice that like that changed a lot so I guess we'll just kind of go back to where we were that's reasonably close. Okay. So the other part of this is we need to match the output of the PA to something that we can actually use. And so we're starting with 2.7 ohms it says. And we're trying to get to 50 ohms. And again our frequency is 6900 
kilohertz. So let's run a calculation and see what it says. And so it says that the series L for low pass filter is going to need to be approximately 1900 picofarads. with a series inductance of 260 nanohenries. Well, we know from the, the first part that we're supposed to have 253 nanohenries. Now, because you need to kind of look at this circuit in two parts. And again, I'm, I am no expert on Class E. This is just kind of what I've figured out from experimenting. But if you look at it this way, you can kind of see it in two parts. So like this side is the Class EPA. This is technically the matching network. So what we can do, since they both share a coil on the output and the input, we can just combine these two values together. So our total inductance value becomes approximately 510 nanohenries, and that's how I came up with that value originally. The rest of it stays pretty much the same. So based on that information, we should find out if this is going to work or not. And this is basically the point where we start building the circuit, because I think, think I've pretty much exhausted this end of the subject. Anyway. Again, this is the first time we're doing one of these live, so if it's a little dry, I apologize for that. Always looking for feedback, so feel free to shoot me up on email if you'd like to. The address should be familiar to most of you guys if you know what we do outside of engineering. It's xfmshortwave at gmail.com. Also, you can message us through the, uh, through the YouTube channel and stuff like that. So let's talk about the physical build and kind of the idea I've got in my head. I've already got some of these little programmable oscillators. You see we've got some for 6925, we've got one for 6875, and one for 6940 and 6975. Now, unfortunately, because I'm out of DIP14 sockets for the time being, we will have to relegate ourselves to using the smaller uh, oscillators, the 8 pin dip guys. So that's fine. We still have plenty of choices in our arsenal of sorts. So you'll see here, this is just a scrap piece of heat sink that I had kicking around in the garage that I pulled off of a piece of equipment. Uh, you can see it had two devices on it. Um, to save time and some of the awkward machining, I've already gone to the trouble of tapping the three holes we're going to need. And I've also gone and drilled the holes in the box that we're going to use. And the idea is we should be able to kind of just stick this together like that. Uh, I've also cut up a little piece of copper clad circuit board. You can buy this stuff off eBay, ham fests, whatever. And these are pretty easy to come by. So this will sit in here about like that. I've got some aluminum oxide insulators, which I like using in RF applications because it just seems to work pretty good for us. And uh, so things of that nature should be just fine. Um, this is a box that I had laying around. I think I priced them out. They're about 18 or 20 bucks. You can get them through Mauser, DigiKey, anybody like that. This is, uh, I think, a Bud CN2706 or something like that. It's a standard die-cast aluminum box. Uh, I would say cheap as Borscht, but nothing's cheap anymore. So that's kind of the story there. Round and round the parts carousel goes. So the first thing I suspect we need to do is we need to kind of figure out how we're going to lay out the traces on this piece of perf board. And to do that, 
usually you just kind of get and again folks this is kind of my first rodeo with this so if it seems a little clunky and and uh, unorganized that's because it is so have no fear we'll get there sooner or later there's a 90 okay there's our MOSFET of choice and from another drawer we should have a 4452 FET driver as well There's a 4452. So those are the, the two critical parts. Also, we're going to need either a 78L05. Let's see. Or just a straight 7805. Since this is only running a crystal oscillator, I think the 78L05 will be just fine. And again, the schematic is just kind of a sort of a recommendation of sorts. It's not really a it's not the be all end all. And we'll need a dip socket for our oscillator. And uh let's see what else we're going to need. Some I'm probably going to use mostly surface mount chip components for the capacitors and such the inductors and stuff will actually have to wind which is not really a big deal uh, here's one that I was experimenting with the other day so it's already sort of built or sort of wound and then we got another one so that'll take care of that and uh, of course we'll need some heat sink grease so we got some of that and a spreading device for said heat sink grease. I cheat a lot of times. Usually I'll just kind of use a, either a greenie or sometimes even uh, just a dental pick like this guy. You just kind of use it to kind of spooge the stuff onto the uh, the edge of the the device there. So anyway. I guess the first thing to do is I had some hardware around here somewhere okay there's the washer and here's the the other end of it now of course we have two irregular surfaces here right so you can't just stick them together and expect good thermal transfer. That's that's usually a poor plan. So we're going to have to grease this up so that we get decent thermal transfer because there is going to be a fair amount of heat that we have to get rid of. Starting to feel like some sort of weird Bob Ross sort of thing. So we'll just kind of get some grease sort of spooged on here kind of paying particular attention to the uh, the areas where we're expecting a fair amount of heat which is going to be around the active devices so just kind of be liberal with it you know get your money's worth and then I just like to take this guy and just kind of like spread it all spread it all along the path there make a couple of different passes and uh, you know I'm sure there's people out there that are like oh god don't do that well then come over here and do it for me yeah that's the thing about the internet everybody seems to know everything about everything until <laughs> until it's actually time to do something and then they start wondering why uh, nobody pays attention to them and that's just the way it goes. Okay, so let's do a test fit here. Now that I've completely sh made a big mess out of all the grease and things, just kind of rub it back and forth to sort of set the grease in place. Also, please forgive me if I lose track of 
what the camera's field of view is because you know, I'm kind of used to dealing with things that are right in front of me most of the time and sometimes you can't really see that so I'm sorry about that but I will do my best it looks like we got a big old mess going on already so heat sink du jour so that's just kind of the way that goes See, we got just kind of a temporary screw to hold this in just so we can do a test fit and make sure that this is all good before we really commit to anything thermal management 101 do everything you can to eliminate as many thermal interfaces as possible because every thermal interface that you add adds resistance and that of course means that the active the temperature of your active device is going to go up which doesn't help anything okay so that looks pretty good at least uh, to my eyes I think that'll that'll treat us just fine so now we need to kind of figure out where the placement of all our active devices are going to go so the MOSFET in question is this guy and um, of course it bears mentioning this is a static sensitive device now the blue mat that you're staring at is an anti-static mat which means it is conductive to static electricity uh, that said it still is not a hundred percent so you know I try and kinda of, you'll notice I kinda of keep contact with the mat at, at all times and also with as many leads on the uh, on the transistor as I possibly can to try and mitigate the risk of of uh, ESD so the first thing I'm doing is just kinda of checking the fit of the height of the transistor and it's too high of course so this is one thing they tell you never ever 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 do we're gonna bend the leads closer to the package they don't like you doing this because it can deform and destroy the internal parts of the uh, of the package and so you can break lead wires and things like that and it can through thermal cycling eventually you can wind up with uh, issues so that's never ever ever do this but so anyway so we know approximately where that's going to land approximately so graced with this piece of information we can go after it with a pencil and kind of mark sort of the spaces between the leads I know this is probably impossible for you guys to see and I'm sorry about that but I'm just more concerned with where are the legs okay so we can put him out of the way for now and you can kind of see my scribble marks so like this is a lead this is a lead and this is a lead so that should give you some ideas to where the parts are supposed to be now as for Mr. Fett driver he's going to live in here as well needs to be a little bit lower than that so this is not quite as bad I guess because the leads are a little bit longer and and this is a static sensitive device as well so keep that in mind and uh, that lines up dead nuts so that's perfect now you'll notice that the leads kind of spalled out a little bit when I uh, did that so I'm 
try and line these back up as best as possible and then line up the uh, traces on the board again and we'll kinda just hold it in place like that and I'm going to mark a spot on the board where this guy needs to go just like that okay and there's the basic layout of our circuit board and I know that's really hard to see because of the light but you can kinda see the layout there so each of these is the legs for the MOSFET and here are the spaces between the individual legs for the uh, FET driver. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make a fairly wide FET trace for the FET driver. Because we know that this is probably not going to change much so this land will be kind of to encompass that and again because it's going to be standing off from the wall of the enclosure a little bit we'll have a little bit of space to uh, build that out So you say to yourself, well, yeah, but that's a solid piece of copper. Yes, yes it is. And there's a sneaky trick that I found out about recently to sort of quickly dead bug these circuit boards. And I will show you this trick. Locate an X-Acto knife like this. You'll notice that the blade has kind of two sides, it's two shapes. You have the sharp end and the dull end. Well, if you flip this around so that you get the dull end, it's got this neat little kind of diggy claw sort of shape. And we can use that to our advantage to dig out the copper. just like that. And so you'll notice the relief in the... I'm sorry, that's probably very fuzzy. But you can see the, the path has been dug in the copper. And then we can just keep doing this until we get an isolated land. Now, of course, it's, you know, the corners are kind of difficult because they tend to get full of uh, gunk and stuff, and you can get little burrs and things. So don't worry too much about that. <clears throat> We're just primarily concerned with making sure that we don't have any shorts to deal with. And th through the aid of test equipment you'll notice that we don't have any continuity to the ground plane, which is excellent. So having said that, that's all good and fine. We need to, um, of course, also make a trace for the rest of the pads. And in this case, we've got, you'll see the so the FET, that FET driver pin will sit there kind of like that. And then you've got a ground pad and then another pad. 
So I think what we'll probably do is since this is ground and this this is power allegedly we'll just bring out a trace like that and maybe do something like this because that'll allow us to put some surface mount components around here because there's nothing over here to interfere with it you can and uh, also we can stick our regulator somewhere off of here so that that works so let's double check do a little sanity check as they say and uh, also the other thing too is you can kind of wingman these pins out a little bit if you decide you don't have quite the room that you think you need so and that's probably just fine I'm gonna make this just a touch wider just so we have a little bit more clearance between the output and this uh, just like that kind of okay now let's work on the power trace for the FET driver so again just kinda and you don't have a whole lot of control over the the blade and what it decides it wants to cut through so sometimes this can be a little hairy you gotta kinda go after it a couple of times but it's kinda just paint by number and I haven't really taken a whole lot of time or thought to figure out how this was all gonna work it's just we're just you're you're watching this in real time I'm just kinda figuring it out and uh, you can do it too because Lord knows if I can do it anybody can do it okay now we'll start on the back side and start pulling back towards just like that you gotta get kinda in close on it so you can kinda see what you're doing I guess and there we go you might have to kinda clean out some of the traces with the blunt end of the blade just to make sure that you've got a, a clean break and there's no no copper curly cues or anything like that in there that could short out the trace and ruin your party because that can happen frequently and that's <clears throat> that's where the multimeter comes in and we're we're good so that one works and let's take a look and see if it still is gonna work for us and I think it will I think that'll work just fine and so lastly we have another trace which run which is the input of the FET driver So and in this case, I kind of went a little sideways on that one. This one I think will run all the way over a little bit. I want to keep that trace kind of short. Because again, the, the node here, this, this this power supply to the FET driver needs to be as low inductance as possible with the shortest amount of inductance as possible. Because any inductance will cause ringing, which reduces the effectiveness of the bypass capacitors and so forth, and, and your drive waveforms will suffer as a result. So we want that nice and clean, if, if at all possible so I'm trying to make this kinda wide 
and uh, the rest of that will just kind of drag over here. Yep, that went sideways on me a little. And this is where we start thinking about the FET driver, because the output pin is there. And the DC input pin is up on the corner, so we're trying to figure out what's the best way to make this work. And sometimes <laughs> there isn't a good way. So what we can probably do here is just kind of make another pad off of the DC side here. So let's see if that's going to work for us. It should. There's that S word again. It should. I think. Again, I'm kind of winging this, so if it doesn't work, well, it doesn't work. Not really a big deal. We'll figure out how to make it work one way or the other. So anyway, the scratch, scratch and sniff technique for making printed circuit boards I found out about pretty recently from a guy's website. I'll see if I can try and find the link to it. I think he actually called it like scratch and sniff circuit boards or something like that. And... Uh, it's kind of an interesting technique, and I saw that I'm like, that's brilliant, I need to do that all the time. Why didn't I know about this years ago? <laughs> and you just, it, it, it's one of those things, you just, until you think about it, you never think to look for something like that. So, <clears throat> anyway, that trace... Yeah, we don't really want to get... We're probably going to have to poke a hole right there and make a via to the bottom side to make sure that that trace is nice and adequately grounded. And probably there, too. So... Now, being the 78L05, I believe these are backwards. Because like a, a typical voltage regulator, it's input, ground, output. And I think the L version is backwards. It's output, ground, input. Because I think I got bit by that once upon a time. Somebody, uh, you know, I, I made the assumption when I laid out the board that it was going to be that way, and I was wrong. So those things happen. All right. I could, you know, I'm trying to think, do I want to do it this way or do I want to do it some other way? Because I would have to come over here, make a pad, go back. Is that going to work? Famous last words, it should. There's that S word again. Well, let's just see what we get. And of course, you're working with a piece of scrap board. You never quite know whether it's going to work or not. You just kind of have to figure it out. Still not seeing anybody out there, but that's okay. We'll just I'll make sure that this video stays on the channel, so if somebody kind of wants to watch it later, which seems to be the the case, um, I don't know if there's like 
mean, I know it's Thursday. People watch football and stuff like that. I, of course, will not, because I have better things to do, like this. Once again, you're watching uh, Red Hat scratching and sniffing circuit boards for the purposes of uh, creating a little HF transmitter, which may or may not work, but, you know... They say, what isn't it the the thing they say the the journey's the important part or something like that? Isn't that what they say? Well, probably. Okay, let's test and make sure that we're st still good. So we've got good good clean traces there. And we don't have any shorts, so that's a good thing. All right. So that pretty much takes care of the drive side of the circuitry. So that socket for the... Uh, socket for the... Uh, crystal will just kind of sit right there like that. So this pad right here will be the 5 volt rail and supply for the oscillator. This will be the 12 volt pad for the FET driver and also the input side to the voltage regulator. And then of course this is the trace that goes to the from the output of the FET driver to the gate of the MOSFET. And then after this, we, I guess, pretty much are concerned with, um, you know, the big stuff. The, the drain choke for the MOSFET, which is uh, obviously how we get power into the circuit, into the power amplifier portion of the circuit. And also, <coughs> that's, that becomes the switch node. So like on the schematic, that's this point right here which is where the inductor connects and where all these capacitors connect. And the pads for these we kind of want to make pretty large because we don't really know at this point what values we're going to need. So now that we've taken care of that part of the circuit, we can turn our attention to the drain node, which is the part of the circuit where all of the uh, all this fun stuff starts to happen. So, and we can make make it as wide as possible because again, circuit strays are not your friend, and certainly because the back of the board is solid copper, each of these traces has a small amount of capacitance to the back plane and that those parasitic capacitances can cause problems, especially with regard to drive waveforms and things of that nature. So the first thing we need to think about is <clears throat> how are we going to squeeze this guy in here? Because this obviously needs to sit probably as close to the uh, as close as humanly possible to the drain while still affording us some access to the uh, the MOSFET because it does have a screw in it so if you want to pull this board out we're gonna have to leave a little bit of room for that so I'm kinda thinking <coughs> maybe we'll just kinda attach it to the board like that which is pretty close to the case but I don't think that's gonna matter all that much so maybe we'll just bring this trace straight out like this And then we've got, you know, kind of a large pad like that. So the drain choke can connect like right there. And then the other side of the, of the choke needs to have a little area like this. So we can put the bypass capacitor, which doesn't need to be very large. 
But let's let's see what I've got in my arsenal. We've got a looks like a is that a one microfarad? Oh, MKP ten. Oops. MKP ten. There's a point one five. There's a point one five, which is fifteen thousand picofarads. So if that sits, I guess, kind of like right there, you've got enough room to stick that guy there, and then you could also put a chip capacitor on the back side. So I think, I think that'll satisfy my requirements. And then on the other side, of course, we have you have these three capacitors to ground, which you've got plenty of space to do that right here. So that's no problem. Just because there are current nodes there, I'd be tempted to put something there. And also, let's not crowd it too much, because we do need to stick this voltage regulator in there someplace. And uh, again, we'll have to figure that out. This is again, this is not a quick process. This is in real time, so feel free to skip around if you'd like. So we also have, like I said, these those two capacitors, these uh, series tuning capacitors, and then we have another inductor, which we can kind of sit probably right next to it. So we'll have that like there. So your little capacitors will sit here. And your other capacitors will sit here, roughly. Okay. And then our inductor will sit here, and connect here, and here. And this guy we can just kind of stick in the corner and flatten his leads out, and that should be fine. So basically, something like that. Okay, <clears throat> so after that we have another inductor that we will sit approximately here. And let's just kind of mark that off. And he's got a couple of capacitors to ground forming these output tuning inductances or reactances, capacitances. And then the output comes right off there. So this is going to be a kind of a compact, very small sort of design and I'm already seeing something I don't like. And that is, I think we're going to have to make this longer. Now the rumor is, with inductors, they can be reasonably close to each other and not really cause any problems as long as they're at right angles to each other. So I think the idea is that's not going to erase very well. I'm just kind of smearing it, but but if this guy is here like that, this guy can be there and I don't think that'll be an issue. Because again, they're at right angles and they're also not in line. So that will minimize some of the coupling between the two components. It's not going to completely eliminate it, but it will keep some of it down. So there you have that. So assuming that we're going to stick our inductor right here, we'll just make that pad a little bit longer. And we'll kind of... So, and again, there will be a little bit of stray capacity there. So, now that we're reasonably happy with 
the location and how we think that's going to work out for us, we can start removing copper and forming our traces. And again, you know, if you make a mistake, it's no big deal. Like if you cut a trace in half or something and you realize later that that shouldn't have been there, it's not a big deal. You can always sort of patch it back together again. And again, it's HF. We're not playing with microwave frequencies here, so we can kind of take some liberties and, and be a little sloppy if we need to be. It's not the end of the world. And we'll continue. Okay. Now we do have the inductor sitting here, I think we decided. So we can cut that. Shout out to Steve Olson. He uh, messaged me earlier today. He was kind of bummed out. He's got something going on tonight, so he couldn't sit and watch the stream, but said if you're going to put it up later on a video, it would be neat to see it. And Yes, indeed. I will, uh, like I said, make sure that this is available for later use for anybody that wants to... Uh, check it out at a later time because as of right now I don't there's still nobody out there so and you know it's it's like I said it's no skin off my nose I've often said some of the best shows I've ever done are the ones where you're out there thinking that nobody's out there <laughs> and sometimes you're surprised but uh, <laughs> unlike the world of radio, I can look and see that, yes, indeed, there is nobody out there. And that's okay. Oh, we have a short. We have a short. And so bring out the loop. Take a look. See where I think I see it. It's right in the corner there. Yeah, I think it's right. Oh, I didn't get the corner. That's what it was. That probably took care of it. Yep. We're good now. Okay. And of course we have the the DC trace on the corner, which is the where the modulated DC is going to enter the amplifier. And actually power the power amplifier. I'm going to make that trace just a little bit longer just to make my life somewhat easier. Because why not? No hard and fast rules here, really. So 
is really exciting, isn't it? <laughs> I would consider editing this down just to make it a little more concise, but on the other hand, does it really matter? Not really. Okay. Pause that refreshes. Ah. Get a little bit of alcohol. Clean off the board. Now you can really see <laughs> all the damage and mess that you made. And so one thing that I do like to do before we get too far into the weeds is make sure that we have some vias. Because the back of the circuit board is going to be largely our, oops, our reference ground plane. And so with the aid of a drill and a very small drill bit, just make some holes. Oops. Of course I pick the dullest, the dullest drill bit in the house. And again. Again, as I mentioned, because because these are fairly high current nodes, you want to make sure that they're want to make sure that they're reasonably good and short, and uh, also we'll put some others just kind of along the way to uh, make sure that we have good ground connections. We already got a hole on that side so we can just kind of reuse that one. Of course, since we did that, it tends to blow out the back. And where is it? Where is it? Here it is. This is a countersink. You can just kind of use it to kind of clean up the holes a little bit. Get rid of the burr. I use countersinks a lot. You'll notice, too, I have a what a friend of mine used to call a rhinoceros turd. It's a step reamer or a unibit or a step drill bit, whatever you want to call it. It's kind of good for many things. So anyway, there's our circuit board. Let's try and sweep some of the mess into the garbage can. Okay. Now that we've got that, now we need to start installing our vias. Let's make sure that the soldering iron is fired up. Make the heat sink grease go somewhere else for the moment. Some place where hopefully it won't make a huge mess. And let's see, let's take a look over over here. And let's pull open a website and go looking for 
LM 78LO5. And let's see. 78L. 1, 2, 3. That's not going to tell us what they are, are they? Thank you, TI. Okay. Yes, as a bottom view. So pin 1 is out. So yeah, outputs on the back side, as I figured. So just a sanity check there. Okie dokie. So let me see if I can get a good shot of this. I just realized that I had had that on the uh, static shot. I'm sorry about that. I'll have to fix that in post, I guess. So this is where we are with the board so far. Um, we have the socket for the oscillator. We have the bypass capacitor for the oscillator. We have the voltage regulator. Then on this side we have a 1 nanofarad capacitor and a 0.1 microfarad capacitor. These are bypasses for both the input to the regulator and also the FET driver which is running off of this rail right there. And so now that that's done we can move on to starting to populate uh, probably the voltage rail for the MOSFET and mount the inductor for said MOSFET. So let's do that. Get you back in focus here. That looks reasonably focused. And again, sorry, I lost track of the fact that you were staring at a data sheet <laughs> for for however long, so I'm sorry about that. That was my fault. Again, you get kind of wrapped up in whatever you're doing. You get tunnel vision, and that's just kind of one of the hazards of doing what we do, I guess. So this is a 0.15 at uh, 250 volt. This is just going to be a just a little bypass capacitor for the uh, PA voltage. Figure out where that about wants to sit. Somewhere in there. So Put some solder. And then over on the far side, closer to where the inductor is going to sit, which is like right here, uh, we're going to put a 1,000 picofarad bypass capacitor just to help scrub off any RF that happens to sneak through the inductor and provide a nice uh, low reactance path to ground try and keep everything from radiating and since you didn't see the last round maybe you'll get a better look at uh, mounting this capacitor this way that's pretty good again I don't claim to be any sort of surface mount expert but I do have to do a fair amount of it these days and it's not getting any easier, that's for sure. Okay, uh, next step, I suppose, is the uh, these other capacitors that we have down here. If this does work, and it seems like it might be duplicatable, maybe I'll go to the trouble of actually laying out a proper circuit board for it, and we can... Uh, Maybe talk about making that available or having having circuit boards made so people can have their hand at building their own. Okay, and that leaves us a little bit extra room on the other side for the uh, for the other components. 
So according to my calculations, we're supposed to have 1,500 picofarads. I wonder if I have anything that large. It's 47, 68, 33, what are these? 68, 0.1, that's obviously too large. Well, on the, the very end, we've got two more thousand puffs and a 56. I'm not going to go to all the trouble of actually uh, completely optimizing this circuit. We're just going to see if it works, or at least sort of half-ass works. And if so, then we can go back after it and kind of optimize values and do some final tuning to peak the power out of it. Okay, there's some of the tuning capacitors mounted. Let's go back and make sure we didn't make any shorts. That's good. That's good. Okay. Good to go. So now on this side, we have to fit these capacitors here so that they uh, will uh, you know do what they do and all that stuff you know and going back to review uh, C2 I think it says it's like 3,000 picofarads, so that's fairly large. So let me see if I've got enough of some value to make that happen. One of these days I should actually go through and label all these bloody bins so I know where everything is. Eh, apparently that's not today. Now the problem is, we have kind of limited real estate here. Never mind the backup alarm in the background, apparently that means my neighbor is home. It's kind of like Bob Ross, except there's no pretty colors to stare at. I don't know, is that a fair comparison? I don't know that Bob Ross would know how to fix anything. But maybe I'm not giving him a fair enough shake. Maybe he I don't know, maybe he built airplanes in his garage in his spare time or something. Who knows? Okay. Nice and sloppy, just the way we like it. So again, I'm I'm sure the all the surface mount people are out there are just like shuddering and unhappy or whatever. Okay, so this inductor I already wound, so we're just going to kind of assume that that is correct. Uh, oops, what do we got here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. So we'll just take two turns off of that. And that should be what we need, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, 
13, right? Right? Is that how that's supposed to work? I guess. Maybe. We'll assume that's the way it's supposed to work. It's not really all that critical. And of course, we have to get the varnish off of the wire. You can sand them. Some people sand them. Some people scrape them. I This takes a little bit more time, but you kind of... It's two steps in one. You tin the wire at the same time. So I kind of like doing it this way. And the uh, insulation melts at a fairly low temperature, so you can just kind of melt it off. And then drop a giant blob of nasty, yucky... nasty, yucky stuff on your static mat, like I just did. Just kind of pull the varnish and snark off of it. Probably add a little more, tin this one back a little bit further, just so we can get it nice and snug on the board. And again, this is the drain choke. This is the, the least critical one in the circuit. I'll just kind of stretch the winding out a little bit so that they're sort of equidistant. And then we'll just kind of flatten them out. Just like that. Trim them. Make sure that's... Make sure you got all the varnish off. And now, here's a, another little trick. You're not supposed to use... You're not supposed to use RTV on electronics because it's has, uh, in the process of curing it generates acetic acid which is corrosive. This stuff dries hard as a rock and doesn't seem to have quite the same problem. So I like using bathtub sealant. So we'll just put that there. And a little dab will do you. And like I said, when the stuff dries, it dries hard as a rock. And uh, even to the point that you don't really need anything else to affix it to the to the circuit board. And I've you look at this little little this little filter I made. It's done the same way, and it's it's almost like glue. So we'll just. Make sure that we've got it kind of where we want it. And just kind of press it down into place. Of course you have to, if you have to take turns off of it or something. It can be a real <laughs> real kind of pain in the butt, but you gotta take the good with the bad, I suppose. But that'll hold that in place pretty nicely for us. And of course if it doesn't stick you can always go back and put a little more on it. And uh, let's check and make sure that we still haven't created any shorts. It's all good. Okay. And so finally we need to make 
the output inductor and according to this it's eight turns of wire on a T94 material 6 toroid or material 2 that's a typo I did the math and it all worked out so here's a neat little trick for you if you have an old CD spindle case you can drill a hole in the side of it stick a spool of wire in and it serves as a nifty little wire dispenser so you just kind of do it like that and it keeps your wire spool sort of organized and you just pull out as much as you need and put it away when you're done with it so eight turns right one two three four five we're making these kind of coarse six seven eight do a sanity check one two three four five six seven eight there you go I'll kind of spread the winding out a little bit Okay. Once again, we'll kind of bend the leads out. Kind of do a test fit. That looks good. Dress the leads a little bit. Get our schmoo.
there you have it. And again, once once that firms up a little bit, we can add a little bit of uh, a little bit more to try and firm up the uh, the connections there. So. So now that we have the board sort of mounted, or uh, assembled, we can start kind of assembling the rest of the parts. can tell you the first thing I'm going to need is a longer screw. Because that's going to have to go into an insulator and then through the box and into the heat sink and so I'm going to need for sure a longer screw than that. Fortunately we have plenty. This is apparently five eighths, which is probably too long. So you have to go through the transistor body. That's probably about right, actually. So I'll just move the washer. And the lock washer. And then we'll have to get some more of our wonderful heat sink compound. usually kind of a questionable fit so that's always kind of a concern as well and we'll just grease the back of the transistor just like that and just drop them in there And already I can tell you that screw is not long enough. Because it went almost all the way through. <laughs> so, we'll try again with a longer screw. There we go. I get some. Should get be able to get some bite out of that one. Hopefully. If it'll even line up for me. making the trip here. Uh-oh. <laughs> I have to slide it a little bit. There we go. The alignment was just a little bit too tight, so... You're always kind of playing games with trying to get these guys to line up anyway. And this is just kind of a, a test fit 
Anyway, let me see if I can see if I can find something to lean this against. So you can kind of see what's going on in here. I don't think that's going to quite clear, unfortunately. So we'll have to... Pull them out and so yes, all those rules about you know, don't bend the leads, yada 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 yeah, we're pretty much violating all that right now. I know there's like semiconductor engineers sometime that'll see this and say, oh my god, what's he doing? You know. There's the right way, there's the wrong way, and then there's my way. It's still not behaving. slide that under there. Oh yeah, that'll work. Maybe a little tricky to get that back. A little tricky to get that back uh, wire in player, that uh, lead soldered, the source for the MOSFET, but them's the brakes, I suppose. Also, it's occurring to me it's going to be somewhat difficult to get to that DC connection for the PA volts as well. So... Oh well. Let's see, need a 440 of some length, reasonable length, not too long, not too short, not too tight, just right. And we'll also need one of those goofy little nylon short me not insulators. I had a bunch of those somewhere. Just never can seem to find them when you need them. Oh, there they are. Microchip in their infinite wisdom, uh, or whoever designed these parts, I'm sure did it for ease. But the... Uh, the tab of the semiconductor, the, pe the, the FET driver, the tab, is tied to VCC. And that's one of the reasons I like the IXYS parts, the uh, IXDN614s and all those guys, because the tab on those is tied to ground. So it's much easier to mount that part because you don't need the insulated washer and you don't need an insulator if, you're, if your signal ground is the same. You can just kind of throw them in there and they just work. Not the case with these guys. These you have to use an insulated washer get it to fit in there and it's just it's just a pain but uh, if 
first world problems, right? First world problems. if I have a longer screwdriver I could get in there a little easier got a stubby wonder if my stubby will work <laughs> it's just barely too long well, this will at least get us in the ballpark anyway to at least get the thing mounted just like that Okay. Now we can go and kind of clean up the bend the traces a little bit to fit the fit the circuit board a little bit better. Cuz they are a little little bit sideways. And part of that's probably the not so great precision on my part for putting this together the way I did, but that's just the way it goes sometimes, I guess. Okay. I'm sure this is terribly interesting. We're <laughs> two hours into this project, and you're basically watching one of these get built live, so there is some sort of merit in that, I guess. Okay, let's solder the output pin and the input pin. And we'll solder the gate. And the drain. Come on. It's not laying particularly flat, which is part of the problem. And of course the source. All right. And for the FET driver, we have ground traces. And the power traces, which I just bridged. Shame on me. So okay, that's what wick is for. Normally I would go after this with uh, the desoldering gun, but I'd have to wait for it to warm up and I just don't feel like doing that. Almost. There we go. Okay. Now let's make sure that we have no shorts in any of the parts that we just installed. I think we're good. I think we're good. So again, let's tighten up all the fasteners. Make sure that 
all of that's nice and tight. Gut and tight. And I suppose we should have an output connector too, just to make our lives a little bit easier. So I've got some BNC bulkheads here and some washers. It also probably wouldn't be a bad idea to put a uh, some sort of a ground from the circuit board to the chassis because there really isn't one and that's kind of unfortunate so how do we want to do that everybody's favorite tool we can stick a lug nut in here one of these spade lugs and I imagine we can drill a small hole in the corner right here so let me just do that off camera unfortunately That's going to twist around, so we'll use yield center punch. Give us a place to start. And we will drill with the appropriate hole, the appropriate bit, which is hiding somewhere else. That was eighth of an inch big enough. No, but 964ths probably is. Didn't even trash anything. We'll try harder next time. <laughs> and I'll flip this guy over. Kind of bend it up into that sort of shape serve as a ground point for us. And we'll find a convenient nut or something laying around to act as the back end connection for said screw. Just go and zap that corner in. Tack solder it in, that is. Sometime between now and Christmas would be good. Might need a little more heat. We'll have to enlist something with more thermal inertia. So in will come the soldering station, or the, uh, the big boy. So also in the neighborhood, we need to 
put in a output connector. So let's see, somewhere in the middle of there, I suppose. Is that about even? Yep. So we're two inches, so one inch up. X marks the spot. Oops, and be sure to drill nice and sideways like I just did, because, you know, reasons. our pilot hole and I believe we need a 3 ace for these jacks yes you can use a step reamer if you want to although you do kind of have to be a little careful and this can be very violent as well you can wind up you wind up in need of a new battery Apparently that one's done. Stand by, I will be right back with a new battery. And we're back. Ever notice how they keep shipping these drills with smaller and smaller batteries now? Clearly it's a conspiracy. doesn't sound much better, does it? Just like that. Why are you being so stubborn? because it wants to be, that's why. Maybe that's a little overkill. Let's try this guy. There's probably better tools for this, I'm sure. And those better tools are, as usual, somewhere else. Yeah, that'll be good enough to get us through. All right. Find yourself a little piece of scrap wire on the bench. I have kind of a love-hate relationship with these things. Nipex makes many good tools. However, some of their tools are certainly better than others.
the date of this recording is, uh, what day is it anyway? Phone's supposed to wake up. It's the 12th of January. I understand that there was some bad weather moving through the southern Gulf states today. So hopefully, uh, hopefully that didn't affect you wherever you are. I heard, was talking to a friend of mine, and he said that uh, it's interesting because you used to just have, like, tornadoes in the summer, and now you have, like, two seasons, spring and fall slash winter. So the weather patterns definitely seem to be changing a little bit. Of course, that's the, that's the nature of, of nature thinks you've got it all figured out and she says ha ha let me throw this at you and then you wonder why you know things don't work out like you plan and all that sort of thing okay so temporarily temporarily I think we've got all of the necessary parts sort of installed so I can throw a couple of test points in here just to make troubleshooting easier if need be. So we'll add a little test point here on the FET node so that we can go poking around and look at that and see what that waveform looks like. And uh, then we can look at the output as well. For my test points, I just take thick component leads and just kind of bend them into little hook shapes and solder them down, and that seems to work just fine for me. You, of course, may have different preferences, and that's fine. Let's see, we got another piece. I'm going to stick another one on the input to the FET driver in case we want to uh, drive it with something besides one of our little oscillators. So should we, you know, maybe we want to hook a function generator up to it to uh, have a little bit more control over the frequency or so we can sweep it and uh, do efficiency measurements try and find its operational sweet spot that's that sort of thing that would be helpful perhaps so there's that so we have that test point and that test point and uh, we have the output connected so really the only thing left to do is to tack a piece of wire onto the input, the DC input, of the uh, the power amplifier's PAV node. And of course I just dumped that all over the place and got heat sink grease all over creation. Of course, of course. So, this is exciting! Exciting! I'm getting very close to the point of actually lighting it up and see if the last two hours of babbling actually yields us anything. It might work. It might not. I don't know. Again, sometimes you take too many liberties with design, and uh, I have been told that with Class E, you have to be pretty close to uh, the ideal values or in some cases it won't work at all so we're gonna see if that's true okay so there's our PA voltage node which we can hook up to a power supply it is recommended 
for safety and sanity purposes. That you use a current limited supply the first time you power anything up that you build simply because mistakes happen and nobody likes to be greeted by a flash of smoke and and uh, you know two to three hours of your work going up in in one poof because that's no fun and against my better judgment <laughs> I'm probably not going to do that come on you can do it there we go so we're just tack soldering these in these will be our our way of taking a look at the uh, the waveforms we'll just kind of clip our scope probe on take a look at that and let's switch our voltmeter over to voltage and the uh, bench is already getting pretty crowded So I've got a bench supply over here, and it's set up for 12 volts, and we're just going to blip it and make sure that we don't see any ridiculous current draw. And we don't, and we have 12 volts. And the other side of the regulator is 5.0 volts. So our initial DC checks are good. So now we can take an oscillator and just for grins let's do 6925 because that's the frequency everybody knows and loves. And hopefully this is installed correctly. And we'll take a look at the scope and channel 2 is on 100x, 100 meg bandwidth limit, DC coupling. Let's see if we have oscillation. We do. Apologize for the potato vision on the scope camera. Uh, I had ordered a new scope and one with an HDMI out strictly for doing this kind of thing and it got here and the HDMI out didn't work. Womp womp. So anyway, that's uh, that's the square wave coming out of the oscillator. You see according to the counter it's 6925 kilohertz. So that's good. Let's take a look at the the gate node and you'll notice that we have uh, it looks like 12 volts peak to peak in, in about 54 percent duty cycle because we have a little bit of skew there so that's fine so so far so good and so now let's take a let's put the scope on the the drain node and let's set that for something stupid like, I don't know, 20 volts per division. And I'll clear a little spot here on the bench. And we'll bring in a proper power supply. This is a 60 volt, 5 amp adjustable power supply with current limiting and all that good stuff, which is important when you're doing these kinds of silly things. And there's always the possibility that things can go bang or short out, that sort of thing, especially on initial power up. So we'll just clip that on to there. We'll clip this on to the, I guess right here because it's convenient, the DC node. 
and uh, we'll take a look at the scope again and we will slowly walk the voltage up and see if we see signal on the drain of the MOSFET. Guess it helps if you turn the power supply on. And uh, drive source is connected. And we have something. It's not very pretty. That's 10 volts. That really doesn't look very good. And that probably implies that it's way, way, way out of tune. So let's turn it back off again. And we could continue cranking it up, but it's almost guaranteed to let the magical smoke out if we do that. Fortunately, I have a function generator. And so with the aid of the function generator, which you can't see because it's somewhat large, we will, and again, I kind of knew this was going to happen ahead of time, but You never know until you try. So we have, we'll shut down the drive source. We'll pull the oscillator out. Put it back in its little foam. And uh, let's see, store, browse, read. This is already set up for 6.925. And we'll just clip onto that node right there. And there, I suppose. Or somewhere else that's a little better, maybe. You got so much lead length here, it's getting kind of hard to tell what's what, but. Uh, frequency. And again, um, apply drive. And we have drive current. And again on the scope we have our kind of scary looking waveform. So let's see if we go up in frequency if it gets better or worse. The other thing we can do is we can put the scope across the output, the actual across the dummy load, and see what that looks like, if anything. And we do have some output. It says we have like 6 volts RMS. So let's go down. We get more amplitude and more amplitude and more amplitude and more amplitude. That's like 20 volts RMS right there. Current is kind of off the charts there, but let's put say 12 volts into it and it says 24 volts RMS which I think is about 5 watts and we've got about 8 volts heat sink starting to get warm dummy load has a touch indication of warmth 
Yep, two amps, though. I'm not really liking the looks of that. So I think... So peak output seems to occur at 5.5 megahertz, which is a long way from 7. And you go up and it goes down and down and down and down. Yeah, 5.5, 5.6 megahertz seems to be its sweet spot. And it's Impedance is also not really what we expect to see. So if we put 10 volts on the drain or into the supply, we get a really ugly looking waveform. <laughs> that is not attractive at all. So needless to say, we've got a little bit of experimenting to do. But anyway, I think that'll do it for now. I mean, it does sort of work, and considering I basically put no effort into designing this outside of playing with a calculator on some random website, I'm kind of surprised we got this far with it. So anyway, thanks for uh, watching and being out there, and uh, I don't know, we'll see you next time.